So welcome back to this uh, workshop organized by the Collective for Political Determinants of Health. Uh, for any new people just joining us, my name is Katerini Storing and I co-direct this collective, as everyone in the room has now heard multiple times, with Sakiko Fukuda Park. Uh, we're now moving on to a session uh, that focuses on the changing interface between public and private actors in pandemic preparedness um, and response a session which I will also be presenting in. And I just want to remind you that this is a hybrid uh, workshop. We welcome active participation from those in the room as well as from those online. And uh, for those of you on Zoom, you may use uh, the Q&A function for any written questions or raise your hand, in which case we might invite you to uh, pose your question by uh, video and audio. Um, before we move on, I want to hand over to our chair, uh, Ron uh, Labonte, who I'll introduce um, briefly. He um, is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus in the School of Public Health and Epidemiology at the University of Ottawa and has a very distinguished career behind him doing work on all sorts of issues related to the globalization of health, health impacts of free trade and investment treaties, uh, for example, and has worked and consulted widely with UN agencies um, and uh, worked with civil society organizations, including the People's Health Movement. He's also the editor-in-chief of Globalization and Health. Please, Ron. Okay. Thanks very much, Katerini, because very shortly I get to return the favor. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, um, my task is at this point, I just want to uh, give a very brief introduction to all of our, our four panelists. Um, one thing that it's been, a, it's a wonderful experience here in being part of the collective and the part of this event. Um, uh, what is interesting, of course, is that by now we probably know each other's kind of introductory bios uh, kind of in, in our sleep. Um, maybe Anna doesn't because she's going to be coming in you. So a little bit about Anna Marriott. Uh, uh, she leads Oxfam International's health policy work as part of Oxfam's inequality campaign. And she's been doing so for 14 years. And it's probably about the first time that our one and only time that we actually met was around some of those issues, Anna, years ago. Um, she's written and published a number of reports on Oxfam's focus areas of healthcare for all, including equitable and progressive health financing and critical analyses of the role of the private sector in healthcare delivery. Now, she's going to start, but, but after I finish interviewing everyone first or introducing everyone first, so then Kelly Lee. So Kelly's a Canada Research Chair in Global Health Governance, and she's Professor of Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. Previously, a professor of global health policy at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and has served in several leadership roles, including co-director of WHO Collaborating Center on Global Change in Health and chair of the WHO Scientific Resource Group on Globalization, Trade, and Health. And so, Katerini, now I get to return the favor. <laughs> so, Katerini Storing is a medical anthropologist whose research focuses on the social and political dynamics of global health, particularly global public-private partnerships for health. Uh, she leads the Global Health Policies Research Group at the Center for Development and Environment here at the University of Oslo, and she's a co-director, along with the co of the uh, uh, of the collective, and she's also co-editor co in chief with me of the BMC journal Globalization and Health. And then uh, finally, Antoine de Domeni Poivale, the Poivale. What? How do you? I mean, do, do, do I do the Debendi first, or do I just? Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, Antoine is a PhD candidate in International Relations, University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment, and his research focuses on uh, global cooperation to manage disease outbreaks from Ebola to COVID-19, and specifically, he's really looking at public-private partnerships as a new form of hybrid international organization and how these new hybrid acquire and consolidate authority over time. So welcome everyone, and uh, now I would like to pass it over to um, Anna. So hello, Anna. Hello, Ron, and it's wonderful to be on a panel with you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, rather. Good afternoon um, and good evening. Um, my, I'm just going to take a moment to just share my screen and hope that this works. Could you confirm that you can see my my slides? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we talked a lot yesterday about 
the egregious and dangerous concentration of wealth and power and the extreme imbalance between public and private resources. Now, uh, in the development sector, private finance too has become king. We've seen the Washington consensus of which we are all very, very familiar, graduate to the Wall Street consensus and the idea that the only way we can pay for our development goals is to transform billions in public financing to trillions in private finance. And rather than spend public funding directly on, on delivering change, we are told it is instead better to use that development finance to incentivize and crowd in private investments. And today I'm presenting some of the research that I've done for Oxfam into one example of how this supposed win-win partnership between public and private finance is playing out in global health, including how this model performed during the pandemic. So my research looked at the development finance institutions of three European governments, as well as the European Investment Bank and the World Bank's International Finance Corporation, the IFC, and the increasing role that they have played in financing for-profit health um, healthcare providers in low and middle-income countries. As you may already know, these wholly or majority-owned, government-owned, or multilateral agency-owned um, institutions are tasked with funding private um, funding private sector development in the global south. They are backed by taxpayers' money and guarantees. In the case and in the case of the UK, the DFI is entirely capitalized using ODA, overseas development assistance. I should say that they they these institutions finance many, many different sectors, but have been playing an increasing role in, in health um, over the last uh, 15 years. The five DFIs that we've assessed have a mandate to, to help deliver the sustainable development goals, reduce poverty and support inclusive growth. And of course, all of them have obligations to uphold and protect human rights. The rhetoric of these DFIs is that their funding to private healthcare will help close the access gap that this will improve quality and that they will help advance universal health coverage and even gender equality. To the contrary, our research finds not only are these investments serving to corporatize and financialize healthcare and further enrich the millionaire and billionaire owners and shareholders of these healthcare companies, they are in fact exacerbating healthcare inequality driving up healthcare impoverishment and are also responsible for horrific human rights abuses. So our research looks at more than a decade of European DFI funding to private healthcare across all low and middle income countries. We mapped more than $2 billion of investments directly to the healthcare sector, but we know that this is a man massive underestimate of, of the value of these investments since the majority of the investments are made indirectly and this, these funding volumes are not reported. Nearly 60% of the health sector investments that we identified made by the D these DFIs are going into healthcare provision. And most of them are in middle income countries, lower middle income countries. So the first thing to note is that the DFIs are pursuing a highly financialized model. 80% of the health sector investments made by the European DFIs are made via financial intermediaries. Overwhelmingly, these are private equity firms. We also found that of the financial intermediaries being used by the DFIs to invest in health, 80% of them are based in tax havens. This on its own, this high use of private equity is an alarming finding. Um, you may well be aware of the growing evidence of the role of private equity in healthcare and nursing homes from the US and elsewhere, showing how private equity is extractive and to be frank, brutal approaches to maximize shareholder returns by asset stripping and piling companies with debt 
results at the coal face of delivery uh, with poorer patient quality and outcomes and spiraling costs. And a recent um, BMJ article has compared the international evidence around private equity ownership of hospitals and, and care homes um, and has, has concurred with these findings. Mapping the financial model pursued by the DFIs reveals a very um, complex, non-transparent and unaccountable web of actors. This, um, this diagram uh, shows the investments made by five DFIs in just one hospital in Nigeria, Lagoon Hospitals, and you can see the multitude of actors um, and intermediaries being used um, overlapping, tripping over each other to invest in this, in this one hospital. We found that this web was so complex, so convoluted, um, that actually in some cases, we found healthcare investments made by the DFIs that they themselves were not even aware of, which is um, also obviously incredibly alarming. So in many cases, um, the DFIs who are required to make a return on their investments are investing in already well-established powerful corporations with an objective to further increase their market dominance via mergers and acquisitions. There's a huge concentration of investments in India, which is perhaps not surprising, especially by the, the IFC. And the IFC has been instrumental in the growth and dominance of the big players in India, many of which will be recognizable, including Fortis, Apollo, Max Healthcare. In Kenya, these hospitals include Aga Khan, Avenue and AAR, and in Nigeria, uh, the company Hygieia, just to name a few. But as well as mapping this complex model of financialization and, and some of its already wealthy and powerful beneficiaries, our research was focused on two driving questions. Firstly, whether DFI promises to advance universal health coverage are being delivered. And secondly, whether their obligations to protect rights are being upheld. And our research found clearly that the answer to both of those questions was no, including during the pandemic. Instead, our research uncovered harrowing cases of patients being imprisoned in private hospitals funded by the DFIs until bills were paid. This included the case of a secondary school child held hostage in a DFI funded hospital for 11 months, a newborn baby and a refugee. In one DFI funded hospital in Kenya, we identified nearly 40 well publicized cases of patient detentions Yet the DFIs who had funded this hospital for years um, seemingly knew nothing about them. We also identified through our primary research patients entitled to free care pushed into poverty by exorbitant fees um, charged by these hospitals. We also found systematic evidence across, um, across the, the portfolio um, of healthcare investments of urgently needed maternity care, maternity care being far out of reach. Uh, we mapped these fees um, wherever we could find data and found that the starting cost of an un uncomplicated delivery would cost a woman in the bottom 40% over a year's income. We also found multiple cases in our research of emergency medical care denied. Um, this included the case of Kanaklata, who is, is pictured here, um, who was crushed in her own home in a slum next to one of these hospitals um, by bulldozers making way for a new access road to the, to the hospital. She was taken by her friends to, to the hospital next door and the hospital staff just turned her away and said, this hospital is too expensive for people like you. And they told, told her to go. And this brings me to the evidence that we found um, of the behavior of these hospitals during um, the pandemic. And perhaps, you know, a global health emergency is the best test of a theory that investing in commercial healthcare providers can help advance universal health coverage, can increase access and can add to capacity um, for struggling public health systems. 
But we know that research across low and middle income countries. Minutes, Anna. Sorry. Five minute warning. Thank you. We know that the evidence um, in general of, uh, during the pandemic um, reveals alarming trends of unethical behavior by private healthcare providers um, during COVID-19, including the withdrawal of health services and the refusal to admit COVID-19 patients. We also saw filtering of patients based on their ability to pay, price gouging, and holding governments to ransom by charging unjustifiably high fees for that desperately needed additional capacity. We also saw widespread evasion of emergency pandemic regulations by private providers and gaming of new requirements on pricing and bed availability. And in many cases, this led to government interventions to take over beds and threats of legal actions. Now, our evidence um, on the DFI funded hospitals shows that their behavior really very much followed the pattern um, of that international evidence um, with DFI funded hospitals exploiting the situation, exploiting families desperate um, for healthcare by charging eye-watering prices uh, to maximize their income. One example is Maputo, Maputo Private Hospital in Mozambique which had previously been backed by several European DFIs. And it was rep it reportedly charged COVID-19 patients an upfront deposit of over $6,000 if they needed oxygen and over $10,000 if they needed a ventilator. So this was a deposit just to get through the front door of the hospital. But despite these extraordinary fees, IFC made a new investment of $28 million in the hospital's parent company in early 2023. And in Uganda, which was badly hit by the pandemic, International Hospital Kampala is financed via at least seven different um, investments made by the DFIs. It reportedly charged around $270 per day for the treatment and care of moderately ill COVID-19 patients, raising to nearly 1,000 per day for serious cases. And at the height of the pandemic, the IFC bailed out this private hospital with a $4 million loan using aid allocated to it by the World Bank Group. And our report lists multiple other examples of overcharging and denial of treatment with multiple breaches of government imposed price caps. And I'd also encourage you to look up at the research and analysis conducted by the amazing, amazing organization SATI in India, which with an unprecedented survey of over 2,500 COVID patients in Maharashtra found that despite a clear government price cap, 75% of patients who were treated at private hospitals were overcharged and by an average of nearly $2,000. Further research um, conducted by uh, SATI revealed that average amounts of overcharging were far greater in larger corporate hospitals, exactly the type of hospitals that the DFIs are funding. So just to conclude, I um, encourage you to seek out our two reports, um, Sick Development and First Do No Harm, which um, the second takes a much uh, deeper dive into the role of the IFC in India's healthcare system um, and the broader array of findings um, in those reports that, that obviously I can't do justice to today. But most importantly, I feel in our report are the human stories from our primary research documenting the patient experiences, the horrific exploitation of doctors and health management staff who are under pressure to meet um, income targets and the resulting rights violations. And just to say the stories keep coming out since we published our report in June last year, um, there's this new story um, hit the headline in the UK um, just before Christmas of um, a kidney trafficking racket in Apollo Hospital in Delhi involving victims from Myanmar. Um, this hospital chain has been the most prolific beneficiary of IFC funding with many multi-million dollar investments made since 2005. 
So needless to say that Oxfam makes very clear conclusions that this model of investment is dangerous. It's devoid of transparency and accountability and good governance and that it should be stopped. Um, and I'll leave you with the slide of our recommendations, but first to say that we are calling for all of these investments, um, both direct and particularly those indirect um, funding to for-profit healthcare providers via financial intermediaries to be stopped. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Although I'm not sure I should be thanking you for such depressing news, but 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 thank you for for providing us with that information. The work is very very important. So, and now uh, Kelly. Am I supposed to do something? No, it'll come up. You you might try to press the button for the slide. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to again thanks uh, thank the organizers uh, at the University of Os Oslo, particularly Katerini and your team for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work of the Pandemics and Borders Project, which re I represent a very large group uh, who have been working on this issue for a number of years now, and I, I, uh, I suspect for a number of years to come, because we haven't actually resolved this problem about how we manage travel-related risks during uh, a public health emergency. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, my colleagues. I also wanted to say that uh, following from Anna's presentation, you know, public and private interests is at the heart of this, but it's not quite as straightforward in terms of the issue of where the dividing line is between the public and the private interests. It makes it more difficult to analyze um, because um, I think across the board, pub both public and private interests were heavily impacted by the way the travel was chaotically managed during the pandemic. So it's difficult to analyze, but it also, I think, has an offers an opportunity for us to then really amplify the argument for collective action. Um, that that you know, this is a it really epitomizes an issue where collective action across the board could be uh, a way of of uh, achieving and advancing and protecting both public and private interests. So there, there is an opportunity here to advance global governance in that sense. I wanted to take you back to uh, the beginning of the pandemic when uh, WHO declared COVID-19 a public health emergency and recommended against the use of travel restrictions. This was based on historical evidence that they, are lent, they tend not to be very effective. Um, and, and so, a, 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 related to previous outbreaks, and so that was their clear recommendation. And then fast forward just one month, uh, it, it, WHO was um, reiterating that recommendation, but said, said a little bit more, said that under some conditions, travel restrictions could, might, be, might be relevant, might be uh, useful, but you must apply a careful risk assessment in, in the process, but generally, you use them as, as almost like a last resort. And then in, on March 11th, of course, we know the pandemic was described and declared uh, by WHO. But what you see from this graph is that despite these recommendations against the use of travel restrictions, what governments did around the world was adopt a whole range of measures, including restrictions, every time WHO declared, you know, what was stated their recommendations. So it was almost opposite of what um, what WHO was recommending. And, and that's interesting. So this is what happened. We remember, you know, suddenly a world that had s stood still after really record numbers of people moving around the world. We saw cruise ships being shuttered, you know, um, airports emptying, even on the roads having um, border, border crossings really quiet. And that, that's, that was, this is unprecedented, of course, especially in a world where we are so globally interconnected. It was a real shock to the system. 
In Canada, we had a, a, a wide range of measures, and this was part of the problem. It wasn't just restrictions, but there were a whole range of measures that were adopted by each government, and the combination of them and the stringency of them varied greatly, as well as the timing. So we tried to kind of uh, provide a, a, a standardized way of describing what these measures were, because the terminology was just so varied. And so you really didn't know, you know, the difference between a border closure and a travel ban and a travel restriction and so on. So lots of terms being thrown around. So we tr we're trying to create this standardized data set based on WHO's um, uh, uh, database. And we've been then looking at what countries actually did in terms of what measures they applied and when they applied them or lifted them. So this is our graph for Canada. You can see that there were a range of measures that were applied. We could do this for Norway. I know that Norway used a lot of different measures at different times, including testing, quarantine, and so on. Um, so all along, the, as governments did this, they claimed that they were following the science. And you can see this quite often, especially as people were impacted by these measures, could not, you know, travel, and it became increasingly over time quite politically fraught. And so this phrase of we're following the science, we're, we're following the evidence was increasingly used. What we have seen, though, is that this was an evolving body of evidence. There was no clear answer, and bec because the world had never used these measures in such a prolonged and widespread way before, so we're learning as we're going along, and the evidence seems to suggest that you can uh, achieve public health goals of uh, reducing pathogen introduction into a jurisdiction and onward transmission if you use certain measures at certain times in certain ways. But the evidence still is still evolving, actually, because it was so difficult to get hard data during the pandemic. So that this remains unresolved. There's been systematic reviews. There's been a ton of studies, most of them modeling studies, um, and, and we continue to learn what is effective, what is not effective. But what I wanted to talk about really is not that science side, but really is the risk assessment side. So WHO really, as, the, as time went on and they saw that things were um, you know, more complex than they realized, that they advocated a risk-based approach to international travel measures. Uh, and they started to integrate this into guidelines for states and also eventually into the IHR core capacities. So if you look now at the, um, gui the, the sort of annual reporting tool for the IHR and what states need to put into place if they're going to be compliant with the IHR, if you look at points of entry um, or you know, actual borders, uh, th the use of the word term risk assessment or risk analysis is often used. Uh, and this is new. This is very new. And this paradigm shift from really avoid using travel restrictions to using a risk-based approach um, has been adopted across the board, both by the public sector and the private sector. So, you know, these quotes really describe how a lot of the um, economic organizations have really jumped on this and advocate for it. And this kind of balancing of public health measures, or public health goals, and other goals, largely economic, uh, to be honest, but that this, this language is now being used. But when we think of, you know, what is a risk-based approach, we wanted to look at, well, what did countries do then if they were claiming to use a risk-based approach or advocating for it? So my colleagues Julianne uh, Piper, Jennifer Fang, and I reviewed the available methodologies for, you know, what are these methodologies? How do you, ris how do you assess risk when it comes to travel? And what we found was across the 11 methodologies that we looked at, there was really no consensus on how um, they define the source of the hazard, whether it was somebody in coming into your country, whether it was somebody going out of your country, whether it was the pathogen itself. They, they had differences in terms of who they prioritized, at who was at risk, whether it was your nationals, uh, citizens, whether it was travelers, whether it was travel workers, it was quite different. So we went along a different criteria and we found that there was no consensus. And so this makes it very hard for member states to follow a risk-based approach if there isn't an actual one to follow. Um, so what we've been doing in our project is, is to try and come up with a way of 
advising governments on how we could do better when it comes to assessing risk and whether we should use travel measures in a, in a future outbreak and how we would do that. And so we've come up so far, and this is a real work in progress, but what we've come up with is a kind of a decision instrument or decision tree, which is similar to the one in the IHR appendix that, um, that guides countries to, re to report uh, a public health event or not. You work through a tree, and then if it goes, you know, yes report, then you, you go to WHO. So what we're trying to do is come up with a similar thing that could possibly be integrated into the IHR, which starts with, let me just talk about this really briefly, but um, it starts with the, the green, the yellow box with the green um, border, where you're, you have an outbreak and you're looking at the pathogen itself. So not all pathogens, not all outbreaks are gonna re require you to deal with travel-related risks. Um, it, it, you know, uh, we think of monkeypox, or we think of um, other outbreaks where it probably wouldn't be helpful. And so you decide there, there's something about the characteristics of the pathogen. But there's so much more that you need to, th to think about if you decide this pathogen is concerning and you need to use travel measures. Then you have to go along um, to the right and look at your own jurisdiction. And you need to consider what kind of characteristics would lead you either to have travel, travel measures or not. And as you go down this diagram, you know, you go to the risk assessment itself. And if you look at the risk assessment used by most organizations, uh, you will see that really a lot of it was focused on the public health risks, but not on the social, economic, and other and political risks. So having kind of mapped out this decision instrument, we're trying to then think, okay, what are the indicators, what are the parameters where you assess risks along this decision instrument? And so that, that's kind of the work. And the difficult is the jurisdictional characteristic, what, what, um, what will prompt you. It might be your geography, it might be the healthcare capacity and so on. But the point really is that you don't just stop at the pathogen characteristics. Uh, there are many, many different types of risks as well to, to analyze. It's not just the public health risks of introduction and onward transmission. We have to really broaden our uh, considerations when we're trying to do trade-offs and weighing up the different risks, and that means different data. And, and that really brings us into, you know, the, the kind of societal monitoring that you have to perform if you're going to be considering how to manage risk. Um, and as you then do that, we come into well beyond the kind of scientific evidence about epidemiology and pathogen characteristics to really about values and about politics and how politics takes place you know, in a normative framework, and that you need to really take into account um, all sorts of, uh, I guess, decisions about what principles are going to guide your choices as you as you as you go along. And I realize I'm I'm racing through this, but it's really about trying to instill a, a very different pr approach than we're following the science, which really, you know, probably n most people didn't believe anyway, <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, and so. Why, why we advocate this and make it more transparent and more, um, more explicit is because during the pandemic, there was so much inequity in terms of who could travel, who could not travel, and under what conditions. And it wasn't um, very transparent as we went along how those decisions were made. And it certainly wasn't guided by science alone. There were lots of choices about you know, who was more important and, and who uh, to travel and who wasn't. And that, that was uh, something that varied from country to country. So I guess I'll leave you with some key messages. The first is that we have not had to do this kind of activity before in terms of managing travel. And it's because of this novel pathogen that we combated and the global interconnectedness that has led us to this unprecedented situation. Both of those are not going to change. So I think in future we will have um, need to do this better. There's been a paradigm shift now towards away from travel restrictions to how do we use travel measures, but we're still at that point where we don't know exactly how to, how to operationalize that. There remains very limited consensus, therefore, and this is what we need to focus on. In fact, there's very little discussion of this in the pandemic instrument uh, or the IHR revision, which really concerns me because this is actually an opportunity to find a win-win and we're overlooking it. Um, 
And so in doing this better, we need to bring together the fact that we need to have better scientific evidence, but we also need better political processes, and those need to work together in tandem. Uh, and, and in this way, I think then we could really have an opportunity to achieve more effective global governance of, of travel-related risks in future. So I will stop there, uh, and there we are, if anybody ever wants to get in touch. Uh, I know everyone has lived experience of <laughs> this issue, so um, there's still you know, a lot of um, things we can learn from everybody. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Kelly. <laughs> and now the uh, principal voice of this conference so <laughs> far, this colloquium, has returned to sort of present as well. So Katerini, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yay. Okay, so this session is supposed to be about how the pandemic preparedness and response plays out at the shifting interface between public and private actors. And I'm going to focus uh, my presentation on the field that we might call pandemic intelligence, which is concerned with tracking and predicting and simulating infectious disease outbreaks in real time uh, with the intention of informing decision making. And this presentation grows out of our broader project, which is about new forms of public-private cooperation uh, in pandemic preparedness and response. And my aim is really to contribute to thinking a little bit about how private um, authority and expertise and power play out in this field, and what it also ha how um, a private power is interrelated with processes of digitalization that shaped the field. So my curiosity in this development was sparked by news reports at the start of the pandemic um, that the Canadian startup Blue Dot had detected the uh, new coronavirus before the World Health Organization had done so, and then used artificial intelligence to predict its spread. And over the following months, I saw frequent references to another uh, startup called Airfinity, whose expertise within so-called predictive analytics quickly made it, by its own account, quote, the world's leading source of COVID-19 intelligence and, quote, the trusted source of decision makers and media globally. And today it's actually recognized among Bloomberg's top startups to watch for 2023. And um, I think like, companies like Airfinity and Blue Dot, they are potentially pushing advances in, pa in pandemic intelligence that improve our preparedness for future crises. But they are also uh, reconfiguring expertise and authority within the global governance uh, of pandemic risks in ways that I think it's interesting to interrogate. And so I've been trying to study this over the past year or so, and I want to suggest that, that, that their rise uh, indicates that private sector actors, both for-profit and non-profit actors, are playing increasingly important roles and that they have significant power, both epistemic power, institutional power, normative power, and I won't spend a lot of time defining these because I think we've sort of covered it, but they have a lot of power to shape uh, our future collective ability to predict and detect and respond to pandemic risks. And so I want to start by this idea of epistemic par uh, power. Uh, and, and sort of outline or trace how private sector actors have increasingly come to be at the forefront of advancing innovation within uh, big data, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence as the basis of understanding uh, pandemic risk. And it's sort of uh, traditionally international disease surveillance response was managed solely through the World Health Organization. Uh, and its member states. So any member state that discovered a reportable disease within its borders had a duty to report this to the WHO, who then would uh, basically alert the world. And international relations scholars have shown how technological developments and also revisions to the, to the international um, health regulations made it possible from around 2005 for the WHO also to receive information from non-state actors. And these were uh, uh, primarily university-based, uh, unofficial disease surveillance networks that grew up um, uh, out, of, uh, out of this development. Um, scholars like Tina Hunreiter have also argued that this did not um, constitute any threat to the authority of the World Health Organization, which remained firmly in control of this whole domain. But this has started to change with technological developments, where we increasingly see now um, telecommunications and com uh, consumer technology companies involved in experimenting with using their proprietary data 
uh, including mobile phone data and other kinds of data that we do not traditionally consider health related, to try to predict and detect outbreaks. Uh, and, and this has often been done under so-called uh, big data for social good, corporate social responsibility schemes, uh, and have really fed into a lot of imaginaries about the, the potential that artificial intelligence would help us to predict and prevent uh, future outbreaks. Uh, of course, this did not really happen in real life settings, and our, and our colleague in the collective, Susan Erickson, has written interestingly about, um, about how uh, um, the limitations of this kind of technology in, in halting the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. But when COVID happened, um, we saw, nevertheless, huge uh, enthusiasm for the potential of a digital response in anticipation of medical countermeasures. And with Antoine and others, we've worked on this documenting how um, uh, for-profit companies and non-profit com uh, institutes came, uh, became involved in modeling the pandemic. Um, this includes uh, the Gates-funded Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, which others have written about how they have really challenged the WHO's authority in um, health metrics more broadly. But we also saw the rise of platforms like Our World and Data, which became very authoritative sources of, of data relative to the WHO. And it's in this context that a commercial market for predictive analytics grew. We saw uh, management consultancy companies like McKinsey starting to offer predictive analytics to forecast the, the course of the pandemic, and also the, the growth of a previously established uh, Toronto-based company, Blue Dot, that I mentioned at the start, uh, Airfinity, which had been previously involved in, in uh, gathering data about cardiovascular disease and cancer, pivoted to focus on COVID, finding that um, its proprietary algorithms, quote, perfectly positioned it to help with the global response. Um, and what these companies, these commercial actors, seem to be doing is positioning themselves as innovators in this field. And they are really at the forefront of an approach that relies on a log logic of prediction and preemption. Um, and rather than relying on sort of traditional epidemiological or genomic data, as in traditional global disease surveillance, they embody a, quote, modern approach that relies on new forms of non-health related data to model disease trends and make predictions. So this can include data from uh, tele uh, social media or telecommunications or indeed travel. Uh, but also from trade. And so it's not just about projecting disease, but also projecting future demand, for example, for medical countermeasures and how such countermeasures might modify the course of an outbreak. So the WHO is also trying to develop what it calls a modern approach uh, to pandemic intelligence. But a big difference is that whereas the WHO relies on open source data that's in the public domain, commercial companies have access to lots of other uh, data that has to be commercially purchased and they also have proprietary algorithms that they have trained using that data that puts them in their own words at a at an advantage and uh, uh, for producing predictions that have higher predictive accuracy than those uh, that the WHO and its partners can produce and crucially um, Although there is an emphasis on artificial intelligence increasingly, or at least um, machine learning, the companies really talk about how they combine this with human intelligence. And this human intelligence is not necessarily expertise within public health or medicine anymore, but it's more about understanding the dynamics of pharmaceutical markets or uh, strategy consultants. And it's, it's fascinating to me that the CEOs of, of Airfinity, for example, his background is not at all in health, but in strategy consulting. And so these companies are also increasingly commodifying um, their intelligence into so-called intelligence products, data dashboards, risks reports, etc. And so building on their success during COVID, we see that they're now positioning themselves as providers of intelligence projects for real-time public health intelligence across the field and also bio-risks more broadly, providing risk metrics and forecasts on emerging and existing pathogens and threats like COVID-19, but also MPOX and influenza. And so Airfinity's website, for example, says that uh, the company promises to help its clients understand by monitoring global and country level infectious disease risks, to predict by anticipating where new outbreaks will occur, and to, um, and to help them act before that threat reaches critical levels. Now, it's a bit difficult to, to 
check whether this actually happens because all of this is uh, not publicly available. But in any case, um, off of this, um, off of this uh, technical prowess, it seems that these companies are also increasingly influencing decision making about how to manage pandemic risks. So uh, they are in the uh, in the process, I think, trying to or they are challenging the authority of the WHO in this domain. And so we see that companies that previously served clients in the private sector, like hedge funds or bio, other biotech investors, are, saw that their public sector work grew majorly during the COVID pandemic. And so they don't disclose their, their um, clients, but Airfinity, for example, provides testimonials on its websites from the UK government, from the WHO, uh, alongside the pharmaceutical lobbyists and the economists to suggest that it has influence across sectors, including in the pu public sector. And in interviews, I learned that they have contracts with at least uh, a dozen high-income country governments to provide pandemic intelligence. And they claim to be um, also serving international organizations, including those involved in uh, managing the in ACT A. And uh, the company uh, not only claims to be a trusted source, but it also actually makes claims that those who relied on its intelligence during the pandemic actually had better outcomes. Again, we cannot verify this. But where does this leave the WHO? We see now that rather than this being a being a focal an area of focal authority for the WHO, there is a complex ecosystem in which uh, the WHO is essentially competing with a range of nonprofit and commercial actors. And rather than assert its focal authority here, the WHO seems to be positioning itself instead as a global coordinator of a complex ecosystem. And it's trying to bring together diverse actors within what it calls a collaborative intelligence approach. Um, and the hub that was established just two years ago has attracted investment from philanthropic foundations and from some companies, but it has struggled uh, to integrate the commercial uh, providers of intelligence uh, within its approach. Um, and and so what we see happening here is sort of a divide between the public and the private uh, emerging in this field, with, with companies now increasingly also promoting a norm that it is completely legitimate and normal and desirable for commercial companies to be involved in providing uh, what we uh, talk about as pandemic intelligence. Um, and that, that this sort of intelligence should be commercialized. Of course, this norm is really in tension with, with the view that many more public sector actors I spoke with espoused that it is uh, ethically questionable to profit from data that is in the public domain or from uh, intelligence that everybody needs. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, this tension with the ethic of equitable access because, of course, the intelligence that these companies provide is available at a cost. Now, the executives of these companies say that this uh, criticism is, is not, not a problem, really, because they have measures in place to increase access, such as, for example, tiered pricing, creative licensing agreements, etc. But, um, but at the end of the day, we see that no low or middle income country government has entered into a contract with any of these companies and, and their measures to improve access are, um, you know, in exchange for citations or other access. So, so I've tried to show here that uh, private actors, including commercial startups, play increasingly important roles in supplying, analyzing and interpreting the data that we might need to predict or detect outbreaks. Um, and I think uh, that it's surprising, given that there's a lot of emphasis in policy documents about the importance of predictive analytics, that there is very little uh, serious thinking about what role the private sector should actually play in any of the policy documents that, that talk about this. So the strategy document of um, the WHO digital health strategy and the pandemics hub strategy talk in general positive terms about involving everyone, including the private sector, but do not really consider uh, seriously any of the potential challenges of involving uh, them in this domain. So other policy related uh, dialogues like the uh, Lancet and FT Commission on Digital Futures is a bit more sophisticated in thinking about the risks uh, of, of um, 
involving the private sector, talking about how the future governance of digital technologies must be driven by public purpose rather than by private pro uh, profit, but also questioning how we can achieve this when corporate uh, actors have such a large and vested interest in health data. And they suggest, uh, or they're developing a concept of uh, data solidarity as a blueprint for the global governance of health data, which emphasizes strengthening collective control and ownership of data. But there's no clear solution within this framework for how to deal with commercialization uh, or, or private sector actors who may not want to can, uh, participate in this uh, so-called um, trust architecture. And I think we haven't considered very well in these frameworks risks that this involves. These are issues of transparency, uh, of open science, etc., but also potential conflict of interests when private companies are advising governments on the one hand and the pharmaceutical uh, sector uh, at the same time. Uh, we don't know what the risks are of outsourcing intelligence um, to companies operating in what is actually a very uncertain commercial market. We don't know whether this market, although it seems to be growing, may fall uh, victim to the same cycles of panic and neglect that affect pandemic preparedness and response more broadly. So just to conclude, uh, I, the research that I'm doing suggests that over time, commercial sector actors and other private sector actors are playing uh, increasingly important roles in this in this domain and that they are pushing innovation and also shaping policy decisions and norms about the governance of data in ways that we should be paying attention to. Uh, and I would argue that current global strategies really pay inadequate attention to some of the risks that may occur when pandemic intelligence becomes big business. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. You can uh, read more about our work on the on the website of our project, which I've provided here. And yeah, I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Katerini. <laughs> and now it is uh, Antoine's turn. And when I introduced him, it focused on how he is really specifically looking at public-private partnerships. So unsurprisingly, that's the theme of his presentation here, public-private partnerships. Thank you, Ren, and uh, thank you, everyone. So today I'd like to talk about a very specific site of public-private interface, which is public-private partnerships, which uh, I will refer to in my presentation as PPPs, because it's quite a mouthful. So um, the global response to COVID has been uh, primarily operationalized through ACT A, and we've heard and seen this uh, slide from Felix earlier today. Um, and it was, uh, and most of us have heard about COVAX, the vaccine pillar of ACTE, which really was the, the main bulk of the response. And so together, as just uh, to set uh, kind of the, the landscape, ACTE received over $25 billion over three years to uh, lead the global response to COVID. And so with Catherine and Felix, we worked uh, to analyze what ACTE was and define it as a super PPP, uh, mainly because it brings together a coalition of public-private partnerships. So these are Gavi, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, the Global Fund, um, Find Diagnostics and Unitate. Um, and so I think what's interesting here is that the PPPs played a leadership role during the pandemic, and these two men, as we heard from Desmond yesterday, have really the, the, the brain uh, behind uh, COVAX, and so they took a leading role in setting the agenda, in formulating po policy proposals and building poli policy coalitions, and even fundraising afterwards. And in many ways, their leadership role might be surprising uh, for at least three reasons. One is that except for CEPI, none of these PPPs were designed to respond to an acute pandemic. And rather, PPPs are characterized and have been traditionally defined by their narrow mandates, focusing on a specific technology or a specific set of diseases. And so, for instance, Gavi aimed to strengthen routine immunization in children primarily, not respond to acute pandemic. And the Global Fund, for instance, fights HIV AIDS, t tuberculosis and malaria, not COVID. Secondly, the fight against pandemic has traditionally been the role of the World Health Organization. And I think that it's fair to say that public-private partnerships have not been um, assigned a very important role in this space by commentators, at least. And lastly, uh, that's my third reason, um, 
public-private partnerships have been traditionally defined as kind of a network of public and private partners in an arena where there is interaction on between both sides. But I think that, the, and that's my key message here today, is that the pandemic shows that they have become much more than simple arenas. They have become powerful organizations that are capable of shaping policy, and so we need to reconceptualize them, uh, think about them differently. And so I make this argument in a paper that is, uh, these are the proofs, it's coming out very soon in Policy and Society, titled The Rising Authority and Agency of Public-Private Partnerships in Global Health Governance. And in this um, paper, I trace three strategies through which uh, the secretariats, primarily the secretariats of the public-private partnerships, have been gaining authority and, and increasingly uh, have the capacity to uh, shape policy. Uh, the, first, and the first of these strategies is to gain some degree of financial autonomy, and they've done that through by expanding their donor base, by developing new financial mechanisms like uh, IFIM, which Felix talked about, and also by being quite aggressive in influencing their donors, for instance, by setting up lobbying uh, offices in different countries or by being very proactive in, in advocacy. A second strategy that secretariats have used is to increasingly cooperate together. Uh, and actually since 2015, there have been a lot of different cooperation mechanisms set up between the public private partnerships that were involved in ACTE. So whereas some commentators have seen ACTE as this kind of an ad hoc response during COVID, I think actually it has, um, and I think my paper demonstrated that it has a much longer history of building up on, on longer term um, mechanisms. And the last, um, strategy that a secretariat use is to expand their mandates. And I think that's what I, I really would like to spend some time illustrating in this presentation. So if you'd like to um, hear more about the two other strategies, I will refer to the paper. Um, and so what I've done is to basically review the board documents of these five PPPs since 2010. And uh, I read uh, all of their documents and, and annual reports and had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> and I found that um, uh, basically two public private partnerships had made quite substantial investments in pandemic preparedness and response before COVID uh, hit. That was Gavi and Find Diagnostics. And so for, and I'll focus here on Gavi specifically because I think it's the most telling and the most interesting example. So for those who don't know, Gavi was founded in, is in 2000 to strengthen routine immunization for children. And it's a public-private partnership because it's a private non-profit organization governed by a board that brings together donor and recipient countries, but also the Gates Foundation, the pharmaceutical industry, civil society, and independent individuals. And so, uh, an interesting point here is that Gavi has, investing, has invested in vaccine stockpiles to fight disease outbreaks since at least 2006. That's actually quite a long story. It manages a stockpile for yellow fever, cholera, and meningitis. But during the period 2006-2015, that's actually quite a, a marginal investment, less than 1% of its total budget. What really changes the game is the Ebola crisis. Um, where um, the Secretariat developed in less than eight weeks in the period of September-November 2014, a report to the board proposing to establish a vaccine stockpile uh, whose aim was to signal to manufacturers that there would be a market for this Ebola vaccine should it come to place. And the board approved $390 million for this. Um, and in addition to granting a lot of money, the board granted a lot of autonomy to the Secretariat to do whatever they wanted uh, to um, make this project a success. And so as you all know, after Ebola, um, Global Health Security received a lot of attention and Gavi, uh, there was a lot of funding and Gavi sought to position itself um, in this uh, policy development to attract some of the funding. And so there I found that the Secretariat proposed a series of projects to the board, um, which I think is quite interesting because in the strategy that was supposed to guide the Secretariat's uh, policy, there was nothing on doing some things, uh, uh, investments in health security. And so in 2018-2019, Gavi uh, started to work on yellow fever diagnostic, which is kind of unexpected for a vaccine alliance. Um, they worked on pandemic influenza, the Ebola response in the Congo, uh, they joined the polio eradication program. They started to channel funding to CEPI 
to uh, foster the research and development for pandemic vaccines. And so <coughs> uh, these projects, and I think that's also a key finding of my paper, they were not approved without trouble by the board, and I, I found that uh, I could trace several um, uh, heated discussions and debates within Gavi's board, which is quite uh, rare in, a, in an organization that really takes decision by consensus. And so in uh, several instances, some board members expressed minority positions ex uh, against uh, the investments, which means that they do not block the decision, but make a clear statement that this was not their choice. Um, and it's only in 2019 that really uh, global health security becomes institutionalized and becomes part of the strategy of Gavi. So that gives uh, the Secretariat a mandate to make investments in global health security. Um, and so basically, you, you see that in 2019, Gavi was ideally positioned to become a major actor of pandemic preparedness and response, and that was right before COVID. Um, and so when COVID hit, uh, Gavi was the main organization that received the most funding to, do, to lead the global response by hosting COVAX. They received the equivalent of $17.5 billion over two years to um, um, uh, purchase vaccines and facilitate their rollouts in poor countries. So now, where does that leave us? Um, after COVID, Gavi ended up with a luxury problem <laughs> because they had too much of unspent funds, $2.7 billion. Uh, and so that provoked a, it's kind of a, an, uh, an unprecedented event in, uh, in an organization that is very um, result focused. So they have strategies, they have key performance indicators that are agreed upon before a strategy and they basically implement this strategy. And here you have, uh, and, and of course the strategy is costed, so you have uh, an activity and a, and a budget for that. And here you have a budget but no clear activity. And so um, what to do with this? Well, behind closed doors over two years, there were very uh, heated discussions. And one board member was quoted in, two th in December 2022 saying, the important thing is we do not want them, so the secretariat, to use these funds to broaden their mandate. It's kind of late to say that, but um, apparently it was uh, a lot of, um, of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurial spirit to, to lead this forward. And so the Global Fund also experienced a very similar um, uh, kind of a experience after COVID where the board uh, had also extremely heated discussions. So the Global Fund did not have specific investment in global health security prior to COVID, but took a leading role in ACT-A and was kind of involved in all of the pillars. And that became very controversial uh, when the secretary tried to put pandemic preparedness and response as a key objective of the, of the PPP, uh, whereas uh, a lot of donors and communities who, are, who have this history of fighting AIDS, for instance, wanted to stay focused on the three core diseases. All right, and so in addition to discussing what to do with this money, um, the Gavi Secretariat was very proactive to hold on to this money uh, and deployed very important efforts to consolidate its place in the new global governance architecture that was being negotiated for pandemic preparedness and response and that is still being negotiated. So it became, for instance, recognized an as an implementing entity of the pandemic fund which provides its legitimacy and the capacity to apply for funding to strengthen pandemic preparedness and response. Um, and it is actually also quite active in the negotiations of the pandemic treaty, trying to shape and position itself uh, within this negotiation as a, as a core, um, uh, a core um, organization. And finally, it recently announced that $1 billion of its, two of its unspent fund would go to uh, creating an AMC. So we've learned from Felix that it was advanced market commitment to strengthen uh, vaccine manufacturing in Africa over the next decade. All right, so what can we learn from all of this? What's the, what's the point? Why, why do I say this? A first comment is that public-private partnerships have become powerful organizations that should be treated as political agents pursuing their own interest, not a simple meeting place uh, for public and private entities. And I argue in my paper that this organization, uh, a key driver of, this, um, of their power has been to the development of a substantial bureaucratic apparatus 
that strengthen their capacity to shape uh, policy. And so, <coughs> whereas PPPs are often framed as being lean and effective organization, uh, contrasting with the WHO bureaucracy, you actually see that um, if Gavi and CEPI started with five staff members, Gavi has now 600 staff members, Gavi has 220, and the Global Fund has over 1,300 staff members. So that gives them a lot of power to uh, have in-house knowledge uh, and a lot of uh, and, and strengthen the information and symmetry with their board. And so my study shows that PPP secretariat often shape policy by proposing pilot projects, either in response to a crisis or to demands of donors. Um, and they uh, start cooperating with other global health organizations. But they do not do that by going against the interest of their main donors, but rather by anticipating them. So I think have, there is this ideological component to the public-private partnership model that really plays an important role here, in that um, there is a consensus as to what has to be done, and the secretariat, with their resources, has uh, the capacity to kind of anticipate the needs and propose uh, policies that are well aligned with whatever consensus or whatever um, uh, uh, incentives there, there is for them to, to work on. And so when successful, this proposal are then legitimized and integrated in the organization strategy uh, more formally uh, by the board. The second point I wanted to make is that um, my findings raises questions regarding the accountability mechanisms of these organizations. Because they were created 20 years ago with a much smaller um, secretariat, a completely different organizational structure. And so, <coughs> For instance, to what extent have PPPs boards the capacity to actually control and follow up their secretariats? Um, there, there's been, for instance, a formidable growth of um, board documents and projects to follow up, which might be difficult for the board as a whole, but particularly for board members that do not have the resources to follow up uh, all of this. So that I'm thinking in particular about civil society and uh, low-income countries. And so that might also reinforce power asymmetries within these boards. Um, we've also seen that joint activities like COVAX or other projects dilute accountability because no organization is responsible for the overall project, but rather for their own little part. So by cooperating with others, the secretariats get more leeway and less control, basically, uh, from their board. And that's my last comment to conclude. Um, this organization's success was orig originally meant to be measured by their capacity to put themselves out of business. And I think it's quite paradoxical that they operate on a growth model of ever larger budget, additional missions and increasing staff sites, which uh, raises questions as to whether they are indeed temporary mechanisms that they were intended to be. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, well, uh, we now have about 35 minutes for, for questions and discussion, uh, conversation about this these various topics. I want to encourage people who are online to sort of send in your uh, uh, questions as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, do we, uh, should we start? I don't think we have anything online yet, so shall we start and see? Are there any questions uh, here in the room from people here in the room? Questions or comments? Feel free to editorialize. Desmond and yeah. I have a small question to Antoine, which I probably should have asked him before since we have been discussing this. But, um, I mean, you make a very compelling argument for the increasing power and autonomy of the Secretariat. And I just wonder whether you have enough inside information to, uh, to assess whether some of those initiatives were at least partly or in initiated somebody outside the secretariat, maybe in the board or even outside the board, who would use the secretariat as, as, the, as, the, um, as the mechanism for an idea they themselves have. Thank you. In the back. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is also a question that maybe we could have discussed in the <laughs> corridors of some <laughs> but while we're here. Um, it's a question on uh, the private sector and the public, and I was wondering uh, whether it's an issue of, I think at one point, Katrina, you said pandemics is big business, and there's a lot of talk about big private um, actors. And is the issue, um, obviously we can see the sort of deplorable effects of the private sector, um, 
but is it an issue of big tech and big companies? Because mm. uh, we know that big states are also problematic as well. Um, and what does it mean, for instance, when we talk about manufacturing in the global south, um, we're still there talking about the private sector and smaller mm -hmm. um, kind of companies. And, uh, yep, Remco. And then we can uh, pause and have the panel kind of respond. Oh, and then Sakiko, I think, did, did you want to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, the, and once again, good to see the different uh, interlinkage, interlinkages. Regarding Katarini's and, and Anna's presentation, I was wondering, so what kind of funding is all behind this? this uh, uh, data intelligence, etc., also the privatization. Uh, of course, it's development banks, etc., but who in the end profits? Should we not make a kind of a social network analysis about all the private equity funds that are behind all of this? Who are these actors that are driving these, uh, these investments vis-a-vis -vis also internet in, uh, uh, intellectual property, as we discussed in the first session? Is there a convergence there of those actors? Huh? Uh, and why why is that so? And uh, who, who benefits and what's at risk? And that comes a bit to the second question, and it is to Antoine's. One thing with uh, these capitalist investments is that it, it pushes products on the market that might not necessarily be needed. And at least that's what we've done in our health systems work. We push a lot of vaccines on the market in different places, but do they have actual public health needs? Do they contribute? To the to the to the broader good, and I would argue that in many places, they are pushed to eventually being absorbed by a, in, in a national strategy without having real any valuable public health gains, and and is that considered at all in this expansion of these super PPPs, these local assessments of needs and contextualization? I see very little of it. We do as if it's immediately for the for the for the public good, and I wonder, yeah, your reflections on this. Okay, thank you. Um, it's open for the panel that uh, to respond to any in any particular order about the questions. Um, should I start? Sure. All right. Um, on the secretary versus boards and initiating policy, I think it's very hard to say because I'm not I, I'm not behind closed door. I don't know what happens. Uh, the only thing I can say is that. Um, the secretaries have been extremely good at, at creating polic policy coalitions with donors, with some key players within the boards, and that's what helps them drive the agenda. Um, maybe sometimes even a consensus is reached within the board. And so we know that the Gates Foundation as a whole policy unit following Gavi's work and uh, plays the role of a very powerful kind of think tank. W they also fund the Center for Global Development, uh, which uh, has a whole blog and pr produces a lot of knowledge uh, and, and policy papers around what Gavi should do and what they are. So <laughs> obviously there are some connections there. It's hard to say in practice. I think it doesn't take away the fact that secretariats are, are very powerful in driving this, um, this, uh, these policies, then whether they respond to key interests or whether they they manage to do both, respond to key interests and align with their own interests, I think is probably the, the key here. Uh, and whether on they push products on the market that might not be needed, um, that might be the case. Um, when it comes to health security, um, I think we see a, a proliferation of this idea of stockpile, of global stockpile. And um, of course, it's, it might be a smart investment. If you, you know, have an outbreak, you want to have access to the vaccines, but it's also funds that might just disappear. Vaccines expire, uh, they just go to waste afterwards. And so that requires dedicated preparedness investments that I think at least should be differentiated from the aid budgets that was supposed to fund Gavi for their mission of, of improving health in, in low-income settings. And so another debate that doesn't receive sufficient attention, in my opinion, is you know there's been a lot of um, uh, pr issues with access to cholera vaccines, and it happens that Gavi is uh, leading the stockpile and has been doing so for over 20 years. And so, um, have they, you know, maybe it also should be triggering some reflections as to whether they have the capacity to shape the market and maybe trigger some reflection on their failures to uh, shape the market as needed. 
Yes, uh, yeah, Okay, thank you so much for the comments and, and questions. Um, yeah, I've played around with calling this uh, when pandemic intelligence become big business, but the truth is it's an emerging market and I don't know how big the business is. There are some indications that it is growing rapidly, like um, the commercial companies that I've looked into have grown majorly over the past three years in terms of staff. Uh, and levels of activity, but at the end of the day, their their um, revenue or profits are not in the public domain because they're not publicly listed, and I don't know much about who their investors are either. But what I, I think is, if you see over time, there is a shift happening from you know when the WHO opened up to non-state actors, it was mostly publicly funded university networks. Then we've moved to privately funded. Um, Research institutes like the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, it's privately funded as in it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is a private foundation. You also see that um, the philanthropic arms of big tech uh, companies uh, like Google um, have funded a lot of the research that goes into developing this technology, funding both private research institutes and public universities. Uh, and then you see this latest development, which is really only... I mean, there was a one or two companies before COVID out, developed after SARS, et cetera, that had private investors, but and was set up like a social enterprise, the um, Blue Dot. Uh, but you see the emergence of these other companies uh, like uh, Airfinity and public health company Global, which are private equity um, supported. And I don't know the details of them is the, is the bottom line. But I think, you know, the fact that they have been given these accolades as emerging companies that they, and they are clearly attracting more investment on the back of their performance during the pandemic. And that's why I think it's a space worth watching because I think the bigger they become, the more attractive or the more authority they gain as well. And, uh, you know, their expertise becomes recognized more widely and they are probably able to attract um, uh, public sector contracts off of the back of that. We don't know. I Like one thing I think it's worth looking into is the way in which they resemble or not management consultancy companies because I, as I mentioned, McKinsey and company is already in this business. It's possible that they're using their public sector business to improve also their image vis-a-vis -vis private sector clients and vice versa. I don't know about these things, but these are all empirical questions that I think we need to pay <laughs> attention to. And what is an appropriate level of profit? And I think from, from a public policy perspective, maybe the most important question is how much is their ser are their services worth? Uh, of course, I have no idea what, what governments are paying for these contracts. Um, but um, it is worth asking the question, how much should we be paying for intelligence that it's not possible to ascertain the value of, given that it's all proprietary? Um, so, so Kelly, I, you're looking in, in my direction. I assume you had something you'd like to say as well, and I just want to make sure that, that on a, uh, uh, kind of on Zoom, if you'd like to comment as well. Should I, Anna, do you want to go first? Do you have something you want to... Um, I can do. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I guess just what just a comment um, to the question that was a bit directed at me, but in terms of um, mapping the beneficiaries of this financialization, ultimately, who's who profiting from the investments made by the publicly backed and own uh, government owned development finance institutions. And I think, you know, I think yes, we have to do that, and I, my my aspiration is that um, more of that can be done. I, it is an incredibly technical and difficult task to identify the actors involved in in this web of investments. Um, the the data that we have so far on the, the the companies and the owners and the shareholders of those companies, as I indicated in my presentation, definitely points to the fact that you know it is the rich getting richer through these investments and uh, the powerful getting more powerful um but i definitely agree that we need to do more mapping to understand um the ultimate beneficiaries of this and 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 you know all um hints suggest that um this is you know actually the the ultimate beneficiaries are probably a quite small group of of actors um and I, the only other point I would make about it, um, so I suppose, first of all, to say that if anyone is interested and has um, capacity to do that mapping, I, I'm 
invite collaboration on that because um, I think it, it it really is a is a task that needs doing. One thing that we did notice um, towards the end of our research period is that we saw while de the development finance institutions are using private equity firms that are in the first instance are geographically focused on um, low and middle income countries in different regions. Um, we actually started seeing evidence of takeovers by the more dominant private equity funds like the Black Rocks, like Blackstone. Um, so, you know, we could see that the development finance institutions were playing a first step, if you like, towards this, this making companies more um, attractive to these more dominant players. Um, so that was an interesting trend that would be good to, to look into as well. Um, I had some I had my own comments and questions actually on the other presenters, but maybe I'll come back in the second round. <laughs> and Kelly. What, what I was going to say was what seems to connect um, at least the three other presentations is this ongoing shrinking of the public sector. So you have the expansion of Gavi and then, you know, um, healthcare we know and has been under um, you know, privatization for a long time, but that extension into low and middle income countries is really alarming. But the most alarming I find is is the work that Katerini's describing. So at one point we were describing disease surveillance as a core public, global public good. And that needed, you know, that was the one thing we needed to do and make sure we put funds towards. But now that's now becoming almost privatized. Um, and Blue Dot's interesting because it, it came out, I think, the University of Toronto, and then public money must have gone into that. A doctor spun out a, a company that's done very well. Um, and we see this also in round, um, with the travel issue around diagnostics. So the testing issue, if you wanted to travel, you had to get tested. You had to go to a private company that you had to pay through the nose for. Um, and, and so that became a huge business, of course. All these companies sprung up. No price control. Uh, no quality control and so on. So there's all this, this ongoing shrinking of what is considered the public sector and what we really should be doing, you know, funding through public funds has become further eroded by, by the pandemic. It, it, it's a little bit taking us back to what the basic theme of, of both of these two days has been, um, which is the kind of the, the huge shift that's occurred in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of what is constitutes public wealth and what constitutes private wealth and the huge distortion towards private wealth and then the public policies that have allowed that to occur. And so we're all playing now with a kind of a game where we're sort of having to go out and, and make these public-private partnership deals. Um, uh, uh, the one thing that, that sort of kept resonating for me as I was listening to these presentations uh, was Naomi Klein's book around disaster capitalism. Now, now we, we heard from Ted yesterday that, that he thought that COVID was a tipping point and Desmond sort of questioned about whether it was a tipping point or not. But one thing that seemed to be kind of kept, kind of popping up for me is that, boy, it's amazing um, how capitalism can make a profit and accumulate wealth upwards, even on something like a pandemic and how the pandemic has just created this massive machinery for once again, disequalizing further and further what, what our world status is or what our conditions are. Now, I want to turn it back to questions and, and Sakiko and then uh, from online, uh, Anna. And we have one online. Um, I have a couple of questions. So, Kelly, uh, is this on? Yeah. Yes. Kelly, you mentioned that there was a tremendous variation or a total eclecticism in the methodologies used in risk assessment. Um, can you comment on more on, on that, what that kind of reflects? The politics, the, you know, some of the assumptions, the unsaid assumptions that might be creeping into the kind of concerns that governments have, um, things, of, things of that kind, maybe biases, I mean, anyway, so some, some more information on that. Um, Antoine, um, on uh, my impression is that with these, these PPPs, um, the, the role of the board is very different from the role of the board in um, 
multilateral international uh, intergovernmental organizations uh, and that the board is in fact much more important in setting direction uh, and, and obviously that was because they were set up for that purpose uh, you know powerful actors who felt frustrated by UN type one country one, one vote and felt that my god you know why do I USA have to have the same voice as new a um, uh, set it up like that right but so what do you see reflected in that power dynamics uh, in in the um, in, in, in the board um, and and then um, for Katerini I mean how much does this um, private actors in surveillance come out of the dissatisfaction with the um, kind of public sector performance during COVID. I mean, in the early days of COVID, you know, all kinds of very prestigious scientific organizations uh, predicted the spread of COVID. They were, they were all wrong, right? <laughs> and we noticed that they were all wrong. <laughs> and uh, so this, the, is that feeding some of this? I mean, ironically, those predictors were not public, but at least they were kind of government sponsored. And now, and these new organizations, so what exactly are they predicting? I mean, what, what is the surveillance? Is it predicting new, pan, uh, new, new pandemics or is it mm -hmm. tracing the path and predicting future evolution? Mm -hmm. And what, so what, what are governments are paying for? Well, rather big set of questions there. Um, uh, Anna, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, we have one from Christophe de Costa online. <laughs> it's uh, really about <laughs> Antoine. Surprisingly, it says, looks like some of these PPPs are now also very interested in the climate health intersection as a mandate expansion. And so any thoughts about that? Um, uh, Anna, uh, if you want to pose some questions from online. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question was also to Antoine about, I mean, I mean, maybe this is, is, is obvious, but I think you, you talked about the, you know, analysis of the um, board papers, et cetera, and the kind of quite heated debate about the heated, uh, the expanded mandate. Um, and you articulated clearly the um, opposition to that expanded mandate but I'm quite interested in who were the driving forces about uh, um, proposing that expansion where where do you think the motivation for that was coming from was it just to get bigger and more powerful but why specifically in pan in pandemic preparedness do you think that was the chosen the chosen area um, and then I just wanted to make two brief kind of comments or anecdotes about about um both Katerina and Antoine's um, presentations. The first about, um, so I was very heavily involved in the people's vaccine campaign during the pandemic. And um, at the very, very early stages of our work as a campaign, we heard about Affinity and formed a relationship with them. And they gave us it, at that stage, and we're talking about April, May time, um, pro bono, information and data to help us develop very powerful stats about the kind of forthcoming vaccine inequality that the world would face um and we perhaps went into that partnership with very very naive and um, thinking oh this is great we're getting some free free data but looking back retrospectively i feel like they could see the media attention the people's vaccine campaign was getting um as long as we sourced our, our stats that was giving them free marketing really um and i guess it was you know that relationship was good for a long time and then we noticed their increasing engagement and you know that they were being interviewed by journalists and they were offering their opinions on um vaccine inequality and and the role of the pharmaceutical sector and so you know very quickly that relationship changed before our eyes and we came much more kind of skeptical and the other thing was that the pro bono stopped um, and then lots of people wanted access to that information and started charging NGOs, um, you know, subscription fees um, for for that. And then the second 
comment, I mean, and again, it's perhaps a really obvious one, but, you know, in that debate about vaccine inequality during the pandemic, and, you know, we were campaigning for a TRIPS waiver, um, along with many, many, many um, low and middle income countries, but Seth Berkeley as the head of Gavi was so instrumental in pushing back against that agenda. And you had this, um, you know, fascinating arena where the where Tedros, as the, the head of the WHO, was actually championing the cause of the TRIPS waiver consistently throughout um, the height of the pandemic. And Seth Berkeley was a voice um, in opposition to that, and it was incredibly influential, both behind the scenes and and in public. So, um, yeah, just just another example of that unaccountable um, power. Yeah, I don't know, F Felix, were you going to pose? You got a very short short thing, and then we'll go back to the panel. I hope this works, yeah. A uh, very brief one to uh, Anna and Caterini. Was the data any good? Is there any proof of concept that these companies are delivering something that's useful right now? I, I get the case in theory, but I'm not sure about the, I would love to hear about the practice. And for Antoine, is there something in IR theory or political theory about why the mandate for PPPs used to be narrow? Is there something that stipulates in the theory about PPPs that they are exceptional for building a big airport, building a big bridge, they come out of the construction world. So is there a reason for their mandate usually being narrow and is it, is it therefore inherently a problem that it's now broadening out or not? Thank you. I think now it's really just up to whoever on the panel wants to begin sort of responding to some of these questions and comments that have been posed. Katerina, you want to go first? Um, all right. Okay, thank you again for very interesting uh, uh, comments and questions. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, Sakiko, you asked whether the poor performance of the public sector feeds into this, and definitely the companies that I've been looking into capitalize on the supposed poor performance of, of the WHO by saying, well, the WHO doesn't have access to the sort of data we do, and the access, the data that they have is so politicized, because they say, you know, governments don't have an incentive to report truthfully, but we can bypass that by using other data sources. Oh, IHME, well, I, I don't think they compete that much with the IHME. I think they're offering more sophisticated analytics in their view. But I think that, um, you know, what are they actually providing? I think that has also shifted. So they started off by projecting how the COVID uh, pandemic would develop. And so for that, there is some evidence that they were able to do that. So for example, Blue Dot has published peer reviewed papers, you know, saying, oh, look, we were accurate in our predictions of how this would spread at least initially. But they're, they're not, their intelligence products have become increasingly sophisticated. Uh, and now I think they offer a range of different kinds of intelligence. And I think it depends on what you pay. From This is what I've gathered from the interviews that I've done. So like, uh, like Anna said, you can apply uh, to, a, you can have a subscription where you might get access to a database or to some simple analyses or like a summary of, of risk assessments. Or you can get something much more bespoke where a government might enter into an agreement with one of these companies where they set out the research or the questions that they're interested in and then they receive strategic advice on how to mitigate risks. And it can be things like what is the future risk of um, a new variant of, of COVID-19 or what is the risk that uh, flu will become pandemic. And then they say uh, that they also provide intelligence about how that risk will be modified by the uh, development of new medical products or by shifts in demand or supply. And they claim to have privileged access to understanding that. But it's based on a triangulation of publicly available and proprietary data and then a lot of guesswork. And because most of this data is not available, it's impossible for me to say um, how useful it is. And I haven't been able to yet access uh, first-hand information from any of the clients to assess that. Apart from people in in civil society organizations who, like Anna said, yeah, we were offered some pro bono advice, uh, but we can't, we don't have the capacity to judge how useful this information is. And I think we saw also in our earlier work on technology, on big tech companies that became involved and telecommunications companies, they also initially offer their data and analysis for free or pro bono. And then uh, uh, as, a, as a stage in finding uh, strategies for monetizing um, that data. So I think to Felix's question uh, too, we, we, I don't really know. 
is the answer, uh, whether they're delivering um, anything good. But it's certainly true that, uh, as Anna said, that they they use this sort of public benefit uh, image to, to increase their own business too. And so, like Anna said, they do offer, I mean, they told me in interviews, they offer free access to journalists and to NGOs to some data in exchange for citation. So. I think in the business community, it's often referred to as a lost leader. Yeah, <laughs> which is why on their website they say, we've been cited more than 20,000 times by leading media. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, who want, would like to respond next? Shall I I'll respond to, again, to Sikiko's question about risk. And so we looked at 11 methodologies, um, and each of them are um, summarized in an appendix in the Migration Policy Institute report we, we um, published. Uh, but I'll give you some examples. So different methodologies we're looking at, for example, um, case reports. So d um, how many cases, uh, positive cases of, of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection were reported in the past X number of days? And the days would vary, the number of cases would vary, um, and, and so on. How many people, you know, how many cases per X number of per capita people tested? Um, there was also, you know, who was tested and so on. So that obviously d was different. Um, it also, it's, it's also drawing meaning from them. So if you get how many cases, what's your risk threshold? You know, if, how many cases makes you think, okay, I need to put on restrictions or reduce the number of people coming in from that particular destination uh, or, or origin? So your risk tolerance varies a lot. So that, that was very important to, to look at. Um, but a good example, I think, is where most countries were, in, or most methodologies were only interested in the inbound travelers coming into a jurisdiction. But actually, if you think about it, <laughs> exiting outbound <laughs> travelers were equally, you know, potentially a risk, right? So nobody ever tested people going out and then restricting exit because they were worried about how they were going to affect <laughs> others. So that was, uh, that was problematic. <laughs> so, so again, it's who you care about, you know, the most, who you think is the threat to you, and that caused then very biased methodologies in terms of who you tested, what it meant, how you then turn that into policy decisions. Thank you. Am I going to? Uh, we'll go, Anna, do you have some comments? Um, I think, well, just on the data question, um, and I'm not sure this is this quite answers your question, but one thing I didn't um, share in the presentation was just how little information there is um, available from the development finance institutions themselves on impact of their investments. So we we searched high and low for any evidence that they were that they could provide or that they did provide on the performance of of the private healthcare companies and could find nothing so the ifc has been invested in private healthcare for 25 years in india and there is not one um, published impact evaluation of um, of those investments, whether for for one investment or for across the board, um, what what data does exist um, outside of, of the research that we've done and others have done is the independent evaluation group of the World Bank has done its own own evaluations of the IFC's performance in health and has consistently found again the lack of impact evidence, but also that its investments are benefiting higher income. Um, populations um, and and no evidence that it's uh, improving equity. Um, so yeah, just a, a, a shockingly um, a shockingly absent set of data for for millions and millions of um, investments being made. And I think that also reflects the, you know, similarly to the the setup of Gavi, I suppose, and other PPPs, these DFIs are very um, operate at um, arm's length from the governments that own them. Um, and, and a repeated pattern we saw across the different DFIs is that um, actually the governments have very little to do with, with um, holding them to account on, on the kind of finer detail, such as impact evaluations on, on, on their operations. So 
yeah, uh, no proof of concept um, at all. Okay, thank you. Um, so Antoine, you has so had a comment initially directed to you specifically from yes. Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, and these were really great questions. And um, I think it's important to bring in some nuances in just what I said, in that I was talking about PPPs in general, and all of them have their own specificities, right? And so they're all governed uh, differently. And so I've been talking a lot about Gavi, but you know I, I acknowledge that all of them have their own um, d uh, power dynamics and institutional setup. And for instance, fine diagnostic is governed entirely by independent individuals, so they represent all themselves. Whereas the Global Fund has a constituency-based uh, board uh, and all the minutes are, you know, are public and the constituencies make public statements in advance, so that makes it much easier to trace um, uh, uh, policy discussions and disagreements between constituencies. Um, in Gavi, all the minutes are anonymized and it's very difficult to you know, understand how it's, how it's done. But what is clear is that the board has a much more important role than a multilateral organization that I agree with. I think it's a, a governance system that looks a lot like the corporate government system through with a board setting strategies, key performance indicators, and with measurable outcomes that the secretariat is, is evaluated against. Um, but unlike in a in a corporation where shareholders are want their you know investments to flourish, here you have a you have investment into improving health outcomes, but also diplomatic interest and all and, and different you know interests uh, colliding within the board. And so I think it makes it quite hard to really um, control the secretariat in these conditions in through the same mechanisms. Um, and that also links back to what were the, the questions regarding the driver for uh, mandate expansions. I think they were uh, they're m they're multiple. One of them is the availability of funding or perceived availability of funding. So if, you, if donors uh, signal that uh, health security will be prioritized, it's a big incentive for the secretariat to start working on these things. I also think that uh, the secretariats have been working, um, been dedicating a lot of energy to uh, um, just ensure that they survive <laughs> and uh, and it's not only for the organization's sake i think they are generally uh, convinced that they're doing good in the world and that saving life and that their mission is you know to to do good so by con by enabling gavi to to continue they also think that they uh, save lives at the same time so i think it's a it's a combination of of reasons for that um uh for that um uh, for the driving, the motives driving mandate expansion. Uh, when it comes to climate health intersections, there are a lot of talks about that indeed, and I think I wouldn't be surprised if it's um, if it's included at some point. Although there is also a lot of talks about expanding the PPP model to other fields, and so recently Bill Gates and the Prime Minister of Norway signed an op-ed calling to create a Gavi for renewable energy, and so that also might be uh, kind of a policy transfer of the PPP model to other fields that would be interesting to follow up uh, in the future. And I say I have one minute left to answer the questions on the narrow mandates in the first place. I think the theory was that you should have measurable outcomes. And so the WHO is trying to do everything. Here you focus on one concrete policy uh, intervention that you can measure and get su demonstrate success around. And I think indeed it is a problem that you, I mean the mandates are still narrow. <laughs> Gavi still works on vaccines and it's just an expansion of of the subfields within vaccines where you have a lot more projects and a lot of different policy interventions. But just the multiplication of projects make it harder to have a comprehensive assessment of is it working or not? You know, is it cost effective or not? And, and you know, you kind of um, make it hard for the secretary to have full control over what happens. I think that's the downside of it and that's a problem uh, that might become a problem if these PPPs keep growing. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to assume now that, that that's what you just, how you just finished is your closing remark and open it up for that we have about a minute uh -huh. or two left, unless you've got something you can say in 30 seconds, and uh, for some closing remarks here. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I guess I, uh, one of the, the takeaways that I see from what I've been trying to do is that uh, with the emergence of commercial actors involved in the field that I've been looking at and probably in other fields too, what we're seeing is not just... Uh, actors outside of the public sector trying to help 
public sector actors perform their tasks because they have expertise or data or whatever. But we see them increasingly taking over those tasks. And I think if, I, if you look historically, you see that the nature of cooperation or partnership has shifted from quite sort of ad hoc uh, partnerships to more formalized memoranda of understanding. Like for example, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation has signed an MOU with WHO Europe to enhance that uh, agency's capacity for predictive analytics to actual transactional contracts to provide a service. And so that is a pretty significant shift that I think we should be paying attention to. Thank you. Um, Anna. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess just to say that I think um, I think this research that I've been involved in has opened my eyes to um, the importance of studying the coal face of these types of trends, this these types of narrative, how how these na big grand narratives of billions to trillions that have been so normalized. Um, how our frustration with them um, has increased, but how important it is to actually like follow the money and identify the human impact. And I think I, I really believe in the power of stories to to change people's minds and to to really um, really make people understand um, the the real world impact of these types of approaches. Um, so so a, a shout out for stories, but also you know, we're really one of the objectives is doing this research and sharing the methodology of it is to try and encourage others to replicate it. We were only able to look at a handful of DFIs and um, yeah, we're, we already have had a lot of interest in, in replicating that research for other DFIs, um, but we're really hoping for more. Um, in addition to that, we're really trying to build a bit of a movement um, against these types of investments, um, which you know, to many look very technical and out of reach. Um, you know, these topics of financialization are difficult um, um, topics to, to research. Um, but I think we really do need to get to grips with with that human impact and, and really build a, a collection of um, organizations and activists who, who are eager to work together to stop it. Kelly? Uh, very quickly, I would say what I, what I take away from this session is how carefully we need to think about what are the essential services, um, drugs, um, data, and, and capacities, and I would put travel within that, mobilities. Uh, we'll, we, need, we are need to keep, um, to meet basic needs in our, each of our societies, and when we commodify them, when we commercialize them, and, and um, make them a finite resource that, is only in, that only some can access and not others, we put ourselves in a really precarious situation when it comes to public health emergencies. Mm -hmm. and, and Antoine, if you've got a short last word, please. I think it's all, all our presentation illustrates the need for openness, transparency, and maybe innovative methods to study this, uh, these issues. And so I think we need more cooperation uh, with, with um, civil society, with journalists, and amongst each other, because it's really hard to, to, to look into these things. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we are going to reconvene in about 25, 30 minutes, time after a break, uh, for the final closing uh, set of a panel. But in the meanwhile, uh, thank you, panelists.